So now one of the most exciting tasks of the society president, introducing the Shannon lecturer. Um, before I start, I would like to express uh, my sincere thanks to Dan Costello, who helped me with this uh, introduction. So uh, we gather here this morning to listen to the 2018 Shannon Lecture by Gottfried Angerbach. Gottfried Angerbach is responsible for one of the most important developments in information technology in the past 40 years. Shannon's original papers in 1948, 1949, show that the capacity of a band-limited Gaussian channel was W log 1 plus SNR, where W is the bandwidth, SNR is the signal-to-noise ratio, um, just in case, uh, <laughs> bits per second, and that uncoded modulation was about 8 to 9 dBs away from capacity at error rates of 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6. Essentially, no progress was made on closing this gap for three decades. And in the early 1970s, most people believed that 9.6 kilobits per second was the highest practical rate for telephone line modems, implicitly assuming uncoded modulation. The publication of Gottfried Angerbach's paper in 1982 overturned this assumption and caused a dr dramatic paradigm shift in the field of band-limited data communication. Angerbach showed that simple trellis codes could achieve a coding gain of 3 dB and that more complex trellis codes could gain up to 6 dB without bandwidth expansion. Within two years, Trellis-coded modulation, also known as TCM, was adopted in the CCITT V.32 standard for 9.6 kilobits per second dial-up switched line modems, as well as in the V.33 standard for 14.4 kilobits per second leased line modems. Subsequently, multidimensional TCM was employed in the V.34 ultimate modem stan standard that achieved speeds uh, of 33.6 kilobits per second, and almost all commercial high-speed telephone line modems eventually incorporated some form of TCM. It is re remarkable that, despite more than 30 years of subsequent research on improving trellis codes, no one has substantially improved on the basic performance versus complexity trade-off in Angerbach's original design. Gottfried Angerbach has received several major awards for his work including the 1984 IEEE Information Theory Group Paper Award, that's what it was called back then, the 1994 IEEE Hamming Medal, and the 1996 Marconi International Fellowship Award. He was elected as a foreign associate of the National Academy of Engineering in the United States in 1995. Gottfried Angerbach can be described as one of the foremost practitioners of information theory. Angersbach's work is a living proof that the mathematical theory of communication pioneered by Shannon can have a major impact on practical communication systems. Without further ado, I would like to uh, call Gottfried Angerbach to the stage to present his 2018 Shannon Award Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Ailsie. Thank you. Thank you. I believe I've heard a few exaggerations. You see, or is this? Uh, 20 years ago, I retired from... Does everybody hear me? Okay, 20 years ago, uh, I retired from IBM. 10 years ago, I retired from Broadcom. Five years ago, I thought for the last time channel coding at ETH in Zurich, and now this award. So I had to think about the role information theory had in my career as an uh, application-minded engineer. This is what I came up with. The first topic is a little bit uh, uh, I, sorry, I oriented, yeah? I described to you how trellis coded modulation came about. Uh, next, I'll talk about information theory and then GPST, which is 
the IEEE standard for 10 gigabit transmission over unshielded twisted pair cables. It's an Ethernet standard. And then some remarks on faster than Nyquist signaling. I think I started my career after getting an E degree from the Technical University of Vienna the wrong way. Uh, uh, I started as a systems engineer in the sales organization of IBM in Austria. And on my own, I became interested in multi-stage decision processes. I learned, for example, about Bellman's dynamic programming and Bondry Argen's maximum principle and other optimization techniques. Yeah. I am one, I believe, of the few who switched from the sales organization of IBM into IBM Research. Uh, at the IBM Research Laboratory, I then did a thesis and the first paper, IEEE paper, on nonlinear equalization of binary signals in Gaussian noise. Here I used the knowledge which I have gained from what I had learned here. Uh, when the paper then uh, was submitted, uh, I got a, a, a comment by Dave Forney. I think it was a handwritten letter. Uh, he said, you found the bidirectional sum product algorithm now that is known as the PCHR algorithm and its mean sum approximation, but I had missed the feed forward only version, namely the Viterbi algorithm. So now I knew everything about maximum likelihood sequence estimation, and I looked for applications, and I looked uh, into two areas, namely magnetic recording and voice band modems. Uh, in magnetic recording, we then had a group at, uh, at the IBM uh, Zurich Research Laboratory, uh, and the work led to PRML, partial response maximum likelihood sequence detection, and extensions, of course, they're off nowadays in every hard disk. In voice band modems, I was initially less successful because I could find only small improvements uh, from nonlinear equalization, you would now say maximum likelihood sequence detection, uh, when compared to linear equalization. So the question was how to get larger improvements. From information theory, it uh, was uh, quite clear to me that uh, one should have a redundancy in the modulation alphabet and uh, do coding with the modulation symbols. The goal clearly was larger free Euclidean distance than in uncoded modulation, and this always at the same modulation um, um, information rate and signal bandwidth. The beginning was very small. I considered one bit transmission per modulation interval with 2 PSK. Uh, and you see here the trivial uh, trace diagram section with one state. Okay. Uh, going from 2 to 3 PSK and going from one state to two states, it is really easy to see that you could assign the three symbols in the way as I've shown this here. If you calculate from the improved distance coding gain, then you find 1.76 dB improvement with this extremely simple concept. Why not good? Does somebody know the answer? Yes? Well, you've gone from one dimension to two dimensions. Right, yeah. Right, right. Okay, so let's take uh, the next uh, very simple case. Uh, two bits transmitted uncoded with four PSK. Uh, again, the trivial trellis section. We go to eight PSK, and again, only to two state, uh, state trellis diagram. 
we need obviously uh, four transition out of each state to uh, encode two bits of information. And that leaves only this choice of connections. It is obvious uh, that then among uh, the modulation symbols for the parallel transitions, uh, you would use uh, zero and four or two and six, etc. the symbols which are furthest apart. And then it also relatively clear that from a particular state, let's say here, you send the four symbols uh, which are furthest apart among each other under the eight the symbols of the eight PSK constellation. Calculate the coding gain 1.12 dB. Same bandwidth, uh, same information rate. Now then, of course, let's go to four states. Yeah? With four states, uh, you would have, uh, since you have to have a four transition out of each state, you have the possibility to either have a fully connected trellis or to have, again, uh, parallel transitions. Uh, it turned out uh, that parallel transitions is better, okay? And it's then again obvious that to, to the parallel transition, you assign the symbols uh, which are furthest apart from each other. And again, that you send from one state uh, the uh, symbols, uh, uh, four symbols, which are out furthest apart from each other. Also, on joining, you do this. Yeah? And, okay, I don't have to say more because I, I believe everybody learns this nowadays at school. The coding gain is 3 dB. With a, now, by today's standard, extremely simple coding scheme. From there, it was easy, well, easy, yeah. okay, in any case, I saw it, yeah, that you could interpret this as uh, uh, a binary convolutional code. Here already shown in my preferred uh, form, namely systematic with feedback, okay? And set partitioning, yeah. The set partitioning follows intuitively of what you've seen already uh, for the previous simple case. The set partitioning, I don't have to explain. I just say that the set partitioning induces also a labeling scheme. For example, uh, if this symbol here is transmitted, then you have to go down from here in this partitioning three and you label it with one, zero, Zero, okay? So one, zero, zero, okay? Uh, I don't show any further set partitioning figures here. I go on. Uh, the same convolutional code, uh, parallel transitions, etc. set partitioning, uh, now for 16 QAM. In these old days, this was called still 16 Q, ASK quadrature amplitude shift keying. And the result was now compared to uh, uncoded 8 BSK 4.4 dB. Okay. Uh, the minimum distance error event uh, uh, occurs again here on the parallel transitions. Okay. And this shows here 8 BSK. Do I have the pointer on it? Uh, where's the pointer? Uh, okay, 8 PSK, lower bound uh, on the air performance of coded uh, uh, 16 QAM and simulation result. And you see also one thing, uh, namely that the uh, asymptotic limit, lower limit is, is quickly approached. Why? Because not only do you gain 3 dB in Euclidean distance, in this particular case, also the multiplicity of uh, uh, the smallest distance events is decreased. Yeah? It happens, however, not so for a more complicated code. Then I went on and did further hand-designed codes, maybe up to 16 states. 
but I also developed the theory uh, based on which one could efficiently search for codes with uh, largest Euclidean distance uh, of higher complexity. But I did also another thing which distracted me and then finally delayed the publication significantly. This is what I did. I engaged in the development of my own programmable digital signal processes and the implementation of modems. And this is a picture from 79. Uh, you see here, the signal, first one was called SP12. It's here on this card, hand wire wrap DTL with a multiplier from DOW. Uh, here you see the setup, uh, two modems here communicating via line simulator. And uh, the modem showed uh, at least, I think, two innovations uh, in uh, uh, modem technology, namely one was fractional tap equalization and the other one was trellis coded moderation. And this was the demo for uh, trellis coded modulation, namely uh, no noise, 8 PSK, no errors, uh, add uh, noise such that the error probability becomes 10 to the minus four, then switch over to coded eight, a KO coded 16 QAM, no errors, same SNR, further crank up the noise uh, by 4 dB, and again, you see uh, an error probability of 10 to minus four. Um, in this case, then uh, I had already a group working on this. We did uh, an SP16 digital signal processor. It was even published. Uh, uh, IBM Lagode Laboratory built a chip uh, about the architecture. It was the exemplary pipeline risk architecture. Everything uh, went on overlapped in time, uh, like instruction prefetching, data memory access, multiplication, alloy operation in every cycle. And with this machine, it was possible, although you had only one memory access at the time to data or coefficient of the transversal filter, you could do uh, Finite, uh, finite uh, FIR filters with one instruction yeah, for every tap in an FIR filter. Uh, in the course of uh, some more years, yeah, then all the least line modems were implemented, all the switch line modems were implemented, also a satellite modem uh, was implemented on the Intelsat contract with DLR in German. Uh, Germany with Joachim Hagenauer. If you would hear, he would be here, you would probably tell funny stories about testing this. Uh, and we are being, have been cheated yeah, for gaining, uh, having a coding gain. Yeah? Uh, although uh, it was common wisdom, at least among those who attended this uh, demonstration that you couldn't get coding gain at the same bandwidth and moderation rate. Very quickly, the 1982 paper, I think most students learn about this paper. So what is in there? Channel capacity calculation for high order symbol constellations, surprisingly not done already before. Um, why? Because the focus uh, was on cutoff rate. Nobody believed that uh, uh, channel capacity could ever be uh, 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 approached. Uh, and secondly, cutoff rate was much easier to compute. Uh, then, to just warm up with the paper, hand designed trellis codes, and then the theory how to get the optimum codes uh, for a given number of trillion states. Uh, I can't go through this in any detail. There is a set partitioning lemma, uh, a, a trivial k uh, of a k plus one commercial code lemma, but theorem one, yeah? 
allow, uh, uh, then uh, use these lemmas, uh, and it showed that in searching for uh, codes uh, with uh, optimum uh, free Euclidean distance, you don't have to ex compare all sequence with each other. This is impossible. Yeah? You can do it like with linear Hamming codes. There is a notion of uh, uh, quasi-linearity, but I can't explain this. Yeah? Uh, there is then a second theorem which uh, expedites uh, the code search significantly, and then you find in this paper the code tables. Nobody has ever found codes for the given uh, uh, constraints length of the conversion code with better Euclidean distance. Uh, and further, as an application-minded engineer, carrier phase tracking is becoming a little bit of a problem, and that was dealt with in this paper. And uh, in the end, there was a hint, uh, more a pessimistic hint, uh, on a higher dimensional telescope modulation. This I don't have to explain. Here is the guidance uh, from information theory. You gain 7 dB, yeah, approximately, in going from uncoded to coded modulation if you would have a capacity approaching code. My preferred uh, DCM encoder structure, OK? Again, you see um, systematic encoder with feedback, okay. And this is here, set partitioning mapping, okay. Question to the audience, why did I prefer this? Does anybody know? Systematic, why systematic? You can't have a uh, catastrophic encoder with systematic encoding. All right. Secondly, all you need to know is the parity check polynomials. And this is the minimal set to specify here, uh, to specify a code. And uh, in this implementation, you just need these parity checks, check uh, coefficients. What void in the area of coding and, uh, uh, and modulation did... Uh, Telescoded modulation fill. You see uncoded modulation here. This is a diagram showing free Euclidean distance relative and versus spectral efficiency. Okay, uncoded modulation. Where is the cursor here? Uncoded modulation. And then binary correlation code with QBSK. And that is telescoded modulation. Efficient coding gain versus decoding complexity, real decoding complexity, counting all the operations which you have to do in the encoder. Of course, also subset decoding. Yeah? You see uh, that uh, the codes of the 1982 paper are shown here. And, and here you see the four-dimensional trellis coded moderation initially designed by Vae. And luckily, he found here something where uh, the performance of 4D trellis coded moderation is in this, by today's standard, very low complexity uh, area is higher than uh, one-dimensional uh, trellis. But then it levels off. Why? I said doubling the signal constellation. If you double the signal constellation in four dimensions, you uh, gain very little redundancy per dimension. And that's why uh, this curve levels off. Yeah? OK. Set partitioning and gray mapping. Uh, if you take from the 1982 paper, out uh, this particular code here, 8PSK, uh, 8 states, 
um, with set positioning labeling, and then you draw here the same constellation with gray labeling, then you can discover that there exists a linear relationship between the labeling, the labels. And if you then incorporate the inverse linear relationship in, uh, in this convolutional encoder, then you add up with this convolutional encoder. And so, what you have here from input to output of the encoder is, actually, is completely identical. In many cases, you can uh, substitute set partitioning uh, uh, by gray labeling and have identical uh, encoders. Uh, for my taste, however, having Euclidean distance uh, goal, uh, it was always more intuitive to have the set partitioning labeling. It enables efficient code searches and it naturally leads to the notion of parallel transitions. I have one more chart in this first section. And, okay, I believe this one is new to you. Um, for those in convolutional encoders, codes, uh, you will see here something that you may not have seen before. Okay. Instead of using set partitioning of uh, a signal constellation in a Euclidean si signal space, you could also do set partitioning uh, on a binary n tuple with respect to Hamming distance. Okay. And uh, you can then discover in this particular case uh, n equal 8. This has something to do with Reed-Müller uh, uh, codes and their generator matrix, which you actually see here. And the sequence of uh, increasing uh, Hamming distances uh, in the subset, in the tree of subset sets uh, goes from 1 to two, 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 four, 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 eight, okay? And with little modification, I put in this sequence uh, in my search program for trellis codes for Euclidean uh, space signals and cranked out the codes. For example, here we have a, a rate seven, eight, six, and eight binary convolution code with a free Hamming distance four. Um, Nobody of you knows a better code. This was, however, not published in a way uh, that uh, it could be easily seen by many people. Uh, it went into a book, as a chapter in a book written for, for Jim Massey's 60th birthday in 1994. Uh, recently, I discovered that in 2004, uh, these three authors had a paper, um, and there then also uh, the performances of uh, particularly the uh, in 2094 unknown high rate binary collision codes, they reached the same uh, performance characteristic. And in fact, if one looks at it, yeah, they are not talking about set partitioning or so, yeah? uh, but their approach is essentially equivalent. That brings me to the end of uh, the first part. I'm in time. Next point. Information three in Denji based T. Uh, I begin with a brief history of uh, uh, Ethernet physical layer technology. Uh, you may remember uh, Ethernet started a long time ago. The idea was take a coaxial cable, terminate it on both sides, attach um, stations to it, let them communicate uh, with the uh, collision sense multiple access protocol. However, uh, Ethernet took only off yeah, when uh, 
instead of uh, coaxial cables, uh, twisted pair, unshielded twisted pair cables were used. Star wired to an Ethernet hub. Okay. And the first standard uh, was 10 GPST. 10 megabit, half duplex, I don't know why half duplex on two pair UDP3, um, because I think half duplex because of the hub. Okay, couldn't handle full duplex. Uh, 10 megabit, Manchester coding. Four years later, 100 megabit, uh, full duplex, two pair, UTP5. Yeah? Okay, the transceiver designers made progress, yeah? but also the cable industry made progress, and they uh, wanted to, uh, to sell new cables, data grade cables. UDP is the first in a series of data grade cables. Uh, it used a modulation uh, called MLT3. Yeah? This is not one that information theorists would come up with, but was good enough with these much better cables. There were other standards. Yeah? Uh, for UDP3, uh, 100 megabit, but they didn't make it because the cable industry was successful to sell the new data grid cables. Then came one gigabit. Um, I would say it doesn't uh, use the full wisdom of communication and information theory. Uh, it used, however, a trellis code. In my opinion, a too weak trellis code. And, uh, okay, this was four years later. Uh, nowadays, I believe many of you, if they connect via Ethernet, uh, uh, have a one gigabit connection. And finally, seven years later, 10 gigabit uh, uh, over four pair UDP six, better than six, than five, yeah, plus, yeah, okay, plus meant uh, uh, there were measures taken to reduce alien gross stock from other links which may be running in the same cable. Uh, okay, and this we now want to discuss. I begin, okay, by the way, 10 GPSD is uh, the IEEE 802.3 AN standard. Uh, our first requirement was low transceiver latency because this is used in connecting uh, servers and storage units in a cluster of them. Uh, but the distance up to 100 meters was retained for the maximum distance. Short latency rules out what? OFDM, okay, so it had to be pulse amplitude modulation continuously going on. Um, we have, let me jump to this here. Namely, here you see four pairs uh, of, uh, of twisted pair cables. Unshielded, okay, there is a lot of self knee and crosstalk, also foreign, self foreign crosstalk. And of course, echoes, yeah? And the objective here is to transmit a 2.5 gigabit on each pair simultaneously in both directions. It's a huge uh, filtering, uh, adaptive filtering uh, job. Uh, so we have echo and near end crosstalk of uh, Self near end uh, cross talk. From the beginning, the idea was we want here to have a standard which is based on all the wisdom of communication theory and information theory, a capacity approaching system. What it uses is a 16 BAM modulation on each pair, 800 megabaud uh, modulation rate, 
uh, if you take 800 megabaud, multiply by uh, a spectral efficiency of 3.125 bit per dimension, and this by four gives 10 gigabit. Set partitioning is involved, and low density buried check coding is involved. The disturbance here is uh, alien crosstalk from adjacent links plus uh, uh, IEEE specified uh, a certain uh, av uh, uh, additive Gaussian noise floor. Okay, to understand that we are on the capacity approaching uh, way, yeah, you have to look here at uh, basement transmission with decision feedback equalizer. Okay, so we have here moderation symbols entering, then uh, D2A converter, transmit filter, channel, add noise, receive filter, A to D converter. Okay, sampled at modulation periods of capital D or modulation rate one over T. Okay, let this be given. Okay, next. Yeah, we look at the signal here at this point A, okay, at the output of the A to D converter. Uh, what do we see? We see the se sequence of moderation symbols convolved uh, with the symbol response of this entire thing here, okay, and added noise, okay. And here comes now the decision feedback receiver. It has, uh, comprises a feed forward filter and a feedback filter. And we assume for now that uh, we would have ideal decisions. Yeah? All right. And what is important here is the spectral signal to noise ratio at point A. Okay. The spectral signal to noise ratio is, of course, a 1T periodic function. And it's computed here as uh, the spectral power density of the transmitted signal arriving at this point here uh, divided by the noise at this point. Why is this, or why can this be capacity achieving? Huh? Here we have what I think is an uh, important paper, very important paper. I call it the CDEF paper by Geoffrey, Dudevoir, Ayubolu, and Dave Forney. MMSE, Decision Feedback Equalization, and coding in two parts, okay? What they are looking uh, at uh, is First, they begin with the optimization of the feed-forward filter and the feedback filter in the decision feedback receiver. Uh, and they optimize it with respect to the minimum mean square error at, okay, where's the cursor? At this point, okay? The minimum mean square error sequence, uh, then, Condense noise and uncancelled, that means precursor in the simple interference. And that sequence has to be noise. Yeah? White, I'm sorry, white. Uh, this error sequence, however, contains also a small piece of the transmitted symbol A of T, okay, of the symbol sequence. So the signal here is slightly biased yeah, towards the transmitted sequence of moderation symbols. If you multiply here with, uh, with uh, a little gain, uh, then you can get rid of this bias. And then we have now A of T plus the mean square, uh, minimum mean square error unbiased, okay? Again, uh, it contains noise and precursor into simple interference, but no longer without delay the symbol itself. And for this, you can then, uh, by the way, uh, you take the spectral signal noise ratio function, periodic function, add one, 
to this spectral factorization, you obtain the optimum uh, feedback uh, filter, and you get RS of the, the, uh, the signal to noise ratio at this point. When I speak about signal to noise ratio here, it's RS noise plus uncancelled precursor into simple interference. Okay, and then this is the main result. Uh, the channel capacity of this channel uh, up to point A, okay, which I call SNR sub A, star, because it's periodic, logarithm, etc. Uh, well, obviously, this is the channel capacity. And what they show in this paper that this is identical to this, okay, which looks like Shannon's formula. Okay, the conclusion is what? Yeah? If you would have an ideal a genie in the receiver, which provides you with uh, the symbol sequences of reference for canceling um, uh, trailing into simple interference, then you would have a capacity approaching scheme uh, if you use uh, uh, capacity approaching coded modulation. Okay, but with coded moderation, you cannot have zero delay decisions, okay? So the conclusion here and also in this paper is information in theory guides us to say, do this, uh, train these two filters in the minimum means we are saying. You can easily do this by LMS training. Swap the edge into the transmitter for Thomerson precoding, there exists also other precoding. I'm not going into this detail. And use capacity approaching coded modulation, and you are on the path to capacity. So done in the NGBST. Um, I skip this because I think most of you know what uh, uh, Thomerson Hiroshima precoding is. Uh, when has it been? Uh, First published in 1972. All right, let's go on. Uh, now we actually want to calculate uh, the spectral signal to noise ratio function. Okay, for this we need to know first the cable characteristics, and secondly, we need to know how the transmitter is being built. Here you have the worst case uh, cable characteristics for 100 meter screened four pair unshielded twisted pair cable, category six plus, also known as IS, ISO class uh, E. The magnitude function of the cable, including four connectors. Yeah? And this is the average power spectral density. No, no, wrong, wrong. It's the magnitude function with which alien next and self next could copper into the cable. So we need this. And then we need to think about what uh, transmitter can we build. Yeah? You as information this, you would say, ah, this is easy. Yeah? I know what the channel is. I built water filling filters. And however, you have a problem, yeah? because we have only a, a very low um, power supply voltage available, because we do not want to have an external additional uh, higher voltage power supply. So the only choice is then to uh, do a differential current tack line driver, not the power uh, uh, not a power amplifier, and you also want to have minimal external circuitry. You know, so we have simple passive filtering. This actually here is a first order low pass filter, which has what characteristic here? The line impedance, yeah? because you need to have a line impedance. Yeah? The signal is also coming from the other side. Okay? You need to terminate the cable also backwards, right? So you can calculate here what uh, this uh, 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 transmitter front end does, yeah? and then you can calculate the spectral 
signal to noise ratio function, add one. Okay, star is always periodic, yeah? okay. I make here the assumption of a brick wall receive filter. It is not really important. Uh, the, the receive filter is, this is not critical, yeah? So I simply assume a brick wall receive filter, and I do this for various moderation rates, 400 uh, up to uh, 1,400, okay? The goal of this was yeah, to find out what is the optimum modulation rate in an information theoretic sense. And so you obtain, I'm showing only the positive side in the frequency domain. Yeah? You get for 400, you have this here, okay? The integral over it is the channel capacity, okay? And then for 600, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And now we plot this here. And uh, we don't plot a, a channel capacity, but rather we divide by a factor of gamma, yeah, in order to say we leave a gap to capacity, in this case of 3 dB. Okay? And you see that this curve here peaks at uh, 800 megahertz. And this specific figure here ended uh, uh, maybe otherwise prolonged discussion of what uh, moderation rate the census group should choose. All right, so I did this multiplication with you already before. And so far, about uh, information theory uh, in uh, Danship ST. All right. I show very quickly, uh, I'm sure you're interested in what coded moderation is then finally used. Yeah? Well, this is used. First, you take two 16 PAM symbols together. You consider this, this would give a 256 QAM constellation, you might call it this. Yeah. Uh, you do a first set partitioning, you leave 128 points. Oh. 128 points, and uh, in the standards group, they like the term double square constellation. Yeah, it's also known as a checkerboard instigation. In the 1982 paper, I call it the AMBM constellation, and I believe there are also other names for it. Ah, this is what we discuss here. Yeah. Okay, now what, uh, what do you do further? You do set partitioning. Uh, into 16 subsets, the, uh, 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 the, the subset uh, Euclidean distance, minimum distance increases thereby expressing dB by 12 dB. So they call this the 12 dB set partitioning. By the way, uh, if you have such a constellation, you have seven labeling bits, okay? And we have 16 subsets, so we will have four coded bits to select the subset and three bits to select in an uncoded fashion the signal in the subset. And uh, this is what is being transmitted. Uh, they form uh, a PCM, this in their terminology this is physical, um, uh, what is it, uh, conversion sublayer or whatever. Yeah. Okay, uh, what you see here is, right here. You see, we have 100, 512 double square constellations in this block. Uh, each one is addressed by seven bits. Four bits are coded by uh, uh, an LDCB, uh, LDBC code. By the way, a Shu Lin design modified, yeah? And the rest of the bits are uncoded. Okay, and that, if you work it out, uh, leads then to a physical frame uh, on the four bears uh, of length 232 nanoseconds, uh, which is in indicative uh, for uh, the, the lowest 
uh, transceiver latency that you could have would be a few multiples of that, and that is sufficiently short yeah, to satisfy the uh, constraints uh, uh, on the transceiver latency. This is the end of uh, the second part. Any questions? No? All right. Faster than IQ signaling. This is an idea which is uh, ar uh, around uh, for a long time. Uh, I'm taking here a little fresh view of this. Okay. So it comes in various facets, uh, but I'm choosing here uh, consider baseband transmission or maybe uh, complex baseband transmission, and you have a given bandwidth W. Right? And there may be adjacent channels. Yeah? And we fix the signal power speckle density. Okay? And there is then also additive noise. Okay? But we create the signal with this uh, signal power speckle density with various modulation rates. First one would be Nyquist rate for zero into symbol interference. Uh, uh, this here will be raised cosine roll offs. Uh, I think you are familiar with this. Okay. So this is the Nyquist rate. Then this here is uh, uh, what I call the zero axis bandwidth rate. Yeah? The moderation rate equal to the bandwidth. Okay. And then you may have moderation rates which go beyond. Um, this is actually based on a patent uh, which I did. Okay, to understand this, we again look at a uh, real signal base, uh, base transmission with a raised cosine filtering. All right? Uh, we have, um, we do Thomson precoding or uh, more complex precoding. There will be a precoder. We, which precodes the signal uh, with uh, uh, the feedback polynomial, the inverse thereof. Okay. We have here again our point A. Okay. Here, this is the spectral signal to noise ratio function, periodic function. I define the signal to noise ratio independent of the roll of factor alpha. Okay. So I simply say, Signal to noise ratio is the total power, signal power in the bandwidth W divided by the total noise power in the bandwidth W. And then we obtain here logarithm of uh, signal to noise ratio uh, at point A plus one. Okay, we are after calculating channel capacity. Uh, at Nyquist rate, uh, we have aliasing. Yeah? And the aliasing is such that you end up with zero into simple interference. And uh, uh, the um, channel capacity is then the integral, the integral over this here. Yeah. I'm showing only the positive side. OK. If you expand and if you increase the modulation rate, then to the zero axis bandwidth rate or the channel bandwidth, yeah, then you have this, there's no longer aliasing, and the area under this curve here, namely the channel capacity, is now larger. Okay? Or in other words, uh, as long as you have aliasing, uh, aliasing kills channel, uh, channel capacity. But if you go beyond uh, the zero axis bandwidth range, then you have no further increase in channel capacity. Um, in the present literature, uh, they, I believe they didn't get the point uh, uh, with minimum mean square equalization, and there has to be not signal to noise ratio as a function of f, but plus one. Okay, the plus one is always indicative that you do something with minimum mean square. And then, of course, the logarithm of uh, 
uh, signal to noise ratio shown plus one, if the, log uh, the signal to noise ratio is getting to zero, you have logarithm of one. So it's not getting negative. Yeah? And so therefore, uh, faster than Nyquist signaling can be done beyond uh, the moderation rate uh, equal to the bandwidth. Okay, and now come results. Okay, let's consider here capacity in bits per second per bandwidth. Yeah? Dimension of bits per second per bandwidth is, of course, bit. All right, and here we do the SNR ratio independent of the Rollo factor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I show also for reference alpha equals zero. Uh, this is not really what you want to have. It would be hard to, uh, uh, to, to have a, a sufficient separation from adjacent channels. Yeah? But let alpha be 0.1 or 10%. Okay? Then you see in red is the channel capacity for the faster than Nyquist rate uh, system and in blue for the Nyquist system. Okay? And you see that uh, you are actually losing very little for the not very realistic case of alpha equals zero by faster than Nyquist signaling. Whereas uh, already with a 10% roller factor and let's say a four bit uh, 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 capacity, uh, you would lose two dB, okay? And that loses only half a dB, okay? And that increases. Okay, conclusion or guidance from information theory here says spectral role of diminished capacity. Uh, however, the loss in capacity is much slower, slower, s s smaller uh, uh, than in the case of an Nyquist system. And that brings me actually almost to the end. We've seen that increasing the moderation rate beyond the zero access bandwidth does not further increase capacity. So why should you do it? Yeah? Well, let's first say why should you not do it? Yeah? Well, if you go further on uh, with increasing the moderation rate, you will see that peak to average ratio of the transmitted signal increases. This is not good in the case of nonlinearities uh, or just limited amplitudes in the channel. Secondly, very interesting is this here. Suppose you have a given uh, channel coding scheme. Okay. Suppose you have BAM modulation, uh, Tomlinson precoding or other precoding, gray labeling. Uh, a convolutional code. Uh, my preferred one uh, would be uh, one with large constraint lengths, larger than, uh, so that you need to do iterative decoding and with a low density uh, of ones in this band matrix of the parity check matrix, band in the parity check matrix, which you call low density parity, the guys are sitting here close to each other. Low density parity check, uh, convolutional codes, and uh, spatially coupled codes. Yeah? Okay. Uh, I have not understood the difference. I believe it's the same. Um, okay, and this of a given complexity. And now you have this. Yeah? This takes a certain decoding effort. Yeah? Uh, and you leave this the same, yeah? but now you increase the moderation rate uh, and uh, then uh, for the same uh, information rate, uh, the symbol constellations, by the way, would get smaller, okay? And what happens, okay? The gap to capacity increases. Uh, this is not so easy to show. Yeah, I have a backup chart, but my time is actually over. Um, if somebody wants, I can show I can show him the backup chart, which explains this last point. Yeah, 
uh, it seems from this, yeah, as long as you have a linear channel, uh, that the sweet point is the zero access bandwidth rate. I could make one further point, yeah, okay. Um, I said it already, yeah? if you expand, uh, if you increase the modulation rate, then for a given information rate and a given coding, uh, then the signal constellations are getting smaller, okay? For example, uh, if you start uh, with 128, speaking about complex baseband, QAM, okay? Uh, if you increase the moderation rate, yeah, then you are getting back uh, away, for example, with uh, 512 QAM. Yeah? And that should then actually be less sensitive to nonlinear distortion. Okay. But that is, I think, outside the scope of this talk. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so maybe if you could stay up here, the audience may have some questions. Any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, my question was about uh, trellis coded modulation. Um, you mentioned that it's um, used in the 10 gigabit per second uh, ethernet. And yeah. I was wondering, um, um, is it also used in um, wireless settings and I mean, is there is there a technical? I mean, the reason it's used for for Ethernet versus wireless, would, is there a technical difference, or that's just how things turned out historically? Or <laughs> first, yeah, uh, in the 10 gigabit uh, standard, uh, this doesn't use telescope modulation. It uses the idea of set partitioning, but then instead of a convolutional code a low density barrier check code is used. And, and uh, I may once again say my preferred codes are as stated before and not block codes, but uh, rather uh, what I said before. Okay, secondly, yeah, uh, you want to know, uh, is there a connection to wireless? Yeah? Uh, for me as a communication engineer, uh, I think the differences between uh, uh, transmission over wires uh, or over optical channels or, or uh, via Maxwell's equations uh, 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 through the so-called air. Um, this is all the same field, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, yeah, uh, or, or just to, ma uh, to make the answer short, yeah, okay. This project yeah, was focused on twisted pair, period, yeah, okay? And of course, the guys know also something about wireless, yeah, but they worked on wires. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, we, we have to make it work. So this is just kind of a history question. You, you, I think you said you gave an example where one of your codes with mapping by set partitioning was equivalent to a gray using a gray mapping with a different encoder. <laughs> with as you transform from uh, the labels from set partition labeling to gray labeling, I just did the inverse transform for uh, the commercial encoder. So it's, <laughs> it's not a totally different, different right. encoder. Okay, my question is, my understanding always was that the people at Bell Labs back in the 60s that were trying to apply coding to uh, larger constellations, and that one of the reasons they weren't successful was because they were using gray mapping. They, they were assuming gray mapping, just like you do when you have uncoded modulation. Well, they had not yet found out how to design this uh, coding and modulation together for 
a Euclidean distance score. I, I understand, yeah. but you, you said, I mean, your example was that you could find an equivalent code with gray mapping. Yeah. So I'm kind of wondering why they didn't find that code. Or was it just a matter that they, in a sense, that they Why did done? I not find no, it no, why did initially they or they? Yeah. <laughs> you have to ask them. <laughs> any other, like, any like, other questions? Like they said last night, yeah. some of those guys aren't here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> any other questions from the audience? If not, thank you very much and congratulations. Okay. Thank you.